Episode 11 is taken from Matthew chapter 2, The Magi Search for a King. We came from the east. We came loaded with many burdens. We came across mountains and deserts. We came in search of a king. Great preparations for an extremely long journey had been necessary. It was truly an expedition of a lifetime and it had been very well planned. To undertake such a quest we had pored over the writings of ancient charts, maps and scrolls. Soldiers had been assigned to escort us. We had also arranged for a generous quota of staff capable of practical and logistical thinking. Food, supplies, medicines and coinage were all ordered for the route. All possible eventualities had been imagined and although it had taken weeks we were easy in our thoughts that we had done our utmost to make everything ready. I recall the evening when our journey began. A small dignified gathering at the city gates bade us farewell. Our plan was to cross the desert in the cool of the night, a desert highway guided by stars and that by one star in particular. We were mounted on camels, a considerable number as we were more than a few. With all our servants and guards and baggage we were quite a company. As one of the leading party, I remember twisting my body to look back over my shoulder towards the city not long after we had left it. The majestic sight of our train, silvered figures rimmed by both star and moonlight, caught my breath. We had just set out. We were resolute and fresh. We had nothing to fear and nothing to hide. And at this point we were more than ready to set our minds to the task although in our hearts we knew that this bright enthusiasm would not last. Traversing hundreds of miles across a seemingly barren and unforgiving landscape would see to that. Nonetheless, we were certain that our journey would not be fruitless. This was our treasure, a fine and intricate education. This was our collective lifetime of study, which now seemed to be pointing in one direction. A star had appeared in the western sky, the culmination of our ambition. As surely as if a voice had spoken from the heavens, the star, unmistakable in its arrival upon the scene above our heads, beckoned us with the hope of a great and marvellous king. Our story now strides straight to the final part of our search, arcing broadly over many a minor adventure, desert storms, sudden sickness, bandit raids and unexpected expenses, to name but a few. Perhaps one day all these things too will be scribed. Perhaps now that we are returning to our own land, I may begin to fill in the missing pieces. But what remains? What colours our vision? The very thing that fills our minds as we journey home is the tale we long to tell of what happened in Jerusalem and Bethlehem. Travelling west through many territories, we finally crossed a great river. It was, however, only great in the sense that it was wide and large, but that was where its greatness ended. The environs of the river that we saw and crossed were not particularly noteworthy, but we discovered its name, the Jordan, and on entering Judea, forever guided by our star, we knew that we should first head for the great city of Jerusalem. Unlike the river, the term great could effectively be used for this city. It was beautiful, it was splendid and it was truly great. Its white-walled temple, dashed with gold, stood out from the surrounding landscape, displaying proud elegance and a not insignificant history. Towards evening, the star led us towards the gates of the imposing city. The thoroughfares were busy. The faces we saw, the cultures displayed, all varied greatly. Apart from the Jews, we felt that at any moment we might collide with Roman, Greek, Syrian, Egyptian, not to mention a whole host of other nations represented. To say that the star led us to the city of Jerusalem was, of course, not quite accurate. It appeared to halt over that area of the country, 
though as we arrived it was the city of Jerusalem that caught our vision. Surely we thought there would be somebody in the city, some learned group of people, astrologers like ourselves perhaps, who would be able to help us with the final part of our quest. It was clear that our arrival in Jerusalem did not go unnoticed. We should have understood that approaching the gates as we did, we were quite a sight to behold. However, despite our alien demeanour, there were plenty of establishments in the city who immediately saw how we could fill their coffers. Our unusual presence promised a sudden influx of wealth, and we were not unprepared for that. Expense was not an issue. In fact, the people of Jerusalem had no idea how much wealth we carried with us. After settling into the city, ensuring all parties were fed and watered, and the animals were well housed, we decided amongst ourselves to save our questions for the next morning. We spent the remainder of the evening as we loved best, enjoying the night sky above our heads. On waking the following day, we could not help but be drawn by King Herod's temple. There were other great buildings in the city, a palace and a fortress, but nothing as magnificent as the temple. And it seemed to us that this was a good place to begin our more detailed search. It would be the perfect place to ask questions. But by the end of the day, it was clear that we had been quite presumptuous. Many cultures blended on top of the great temple mount. There was a vast amount of room in the court of the Gentiles, where the temple guards shouldered the issues of crowd control. And there we mixed freely, but that soon ended when we found we were not allowed any further access into the inner courts, which were purely reserved for the Jews. The temple itself was presided over by priests and scribes. Nevertheless, through the longevity of our certain resolve, we continued to ask questions. Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? This, in particular, was a question that seemed to cause a stir, if not offence. In pursuit of our goal, we struggled to explain. We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. None of this seemed to strike a chord with anybody we approached. Our foreign appearance did not in itself ignite rumours, but our questions did. We mingled. We shared some of the goods we had brought with us from the east, and although we appeared to make quite an impression on the crowd, we found very little to help us in our peculiar search. The very people to whom we were most eager to present our theme, the Jewish priests, shunned us. Viewing us, we felt, as if we were a travelling band of entertainers. At the end of a very long day, even compared to a long day riding a camel, we met together back at our lodgings to share our despondent thoughts, our paltry takings from a day's labour. We knew we were so close, and yet as if another hundred miles lay before us, our search seemed thwarted. The following morning brought little more to add to our scant findings. We were beginning not to lose hope exactly, but to lose faith in the people around us. Maybe we should just leave the city, but where would we go? We were not ready to give up having come this far. Restoration in the importance of our purpose came via an invitation from the king. We had not thought that our mysterious design would be of interest to Herod the Great. To our limited knowledge, he was indeed a great king, great in terms of the temple and other buildings he had constructed, and his intelligent administrative policies. All this, we thought, represented greatness. And so we wondered, why would he want to be bothered with a quest of Eastern mystics? Nevertheless, the invitation was clear. Perhaps he understood that we were more than just an amusing diversion. Led by a sharp team of palace guards, from our lodgings through the dark streets of Jerusalem, beneath a starlit sky we scurried towards the palace. Our instructions were that this was a secret meeting, and our hearts raced with renewed vigour and excitement. I remember catching a glimpse of our star every so often as we rounded a corner or crossed a square. 
it was still beckoning us and we were still eager to reach our journey's end. Through the cool palace gardens, where the sound of sprinkling water seemed to follow us, we were guided to a narrow staircase. One guard went ahead and we stepped up behind him, stalling our enthusiasm at the last moment so as to portray a dignified presence before this great king. Herod lay sprawled across a padded couch. Both were decorated expensively. He started at our entrance onto the roof terrace as if we were unexpected guests or was it that we were not quite the guests he was expecting? Recovering himself in kingly fashion, he stood to greet us, ensuring that we partook of the wine and delicacies on offer. We talked about countries and cultures, of great constructions and advances in knowledge. At first we were not sure about posing our questions Perhaps we had mistaken his interest. Perhaps we should wait till he introduced the subject. But I noticed, and after later discussions, I discovered that my fellow travellers did too, that King Herod seemed determined not to look at the sky above his head. When one is on a roof terrace, and one's own terrace at that, and the sky overhead is so beautiful... When the moon is almost full and the dark, rich canopy is blazing with countless points of light, then why would one not want to stretch one's neck to the point of pain and drink in the splendour above? After much dancing around the subject, we eventually ventured to lay our thoughts open before the king, and to our pleasure and relief it appeared that, after all, he was curious indeed. With an intense expression he listened, Apparently he was just as eager to talk about these things as we were, and when we did point out the star, our star, the bold bright light in the sky hanging like a torch southeast of Jerusalem, at last he did turn his head to look at it. The power of its eminent glow held him for some moments, and we waited in silence for him to respond. As he turned to face us again, it was then that I glimpsed a flash of intense rage sweep across his face. In a moment it was replaced by his earlier congenial expression. As a sudden thing, here and gone, it was hardly noticeable, and it was not until later that I took heed of it. Then he drew us in with a question of his own. When exactly had the star first appeared? We answered him with much detail, as much as we felt he could comprehend. As if he held the answer to all mysteries, he proceeded to unveil the joyous news that indeed there was a prophecy relating to the birth of a new king. We were amazed. After the dry and inaccessible well of knowledge we had discovered at the temple, King Herod the Great had the answers, and in that moment I truly thought he deserved the title. He sent us with his blessing to the small town of Bethlehem, a short day's journey southeast of Jerusalem, and we left the king's roof terrace that night with lightness in our hearts and a determination to set off the next morning. His last words, repeatedly warm and encouraging, impressed upon us his desire to play a part in our search for a king. Go and make a careful search for the child, as soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. There were signs, quite a few in fact, as we look back upon that time, that this king was not all he seemed. But they were overshadowed by other signs, the ones we were most hungry for, and unwittingly res we responded only to those. We had little sleep that night, we were anxious for the morning. Although we had mostly travelled by night before reaching Judea, we understood that it would not be polite or particularly safe to continue this pattern through Roman-occupied territory. In the early hours of the morning, the gates of Bethlehem would be shut against us until the following day, so for the morning we had to wait. It became a point of frustration that it appeared to take longer to pack our belongings collect fresh supplies and gather our servants from every corner of the city than it had taken to cross the desert. 
The sun was already climbing above the city walls as we made our way through Jerusalem. Once again we were a strange trailing carnival of eastern magicians, just as on our arrival people stopped and stared as we passed by. We were glad to leave Jerusalem. It was a majestic city, it had much to marvel at, but we felt so utterly out of place. The only person who had welcomed us warmly was the king. It was as if he had a completely different purpose to the rest of Jerusalem, and of course, in hindsight, that was exactly the case. The journey to Bethlehem was only a short trek along a mountain road compared with our epic journey from Persia, and it concerned me that we were well overstocked just for this little trip. Jerusalem, grand and impressive as it was, was not the place where we would find our prize. The town of Bethlehem was in fact our final destination. It was the star we followed as well as the road, and unlike any other time in our journey, the star could still be seen in the daylight for those who knew where to look. Against the glare of a stark white-blue shimmering sky it was a tiny speck, but it did not disappear, and in our mind's eye it held us on the road. Towards the end of the day it began to get brighter as on its first appearance. We called and pointed to one another, so deliriously happy that it had not let us down. It grew in intensity against the purpling heavens. Having travelled with us, having been our guide this long journey through, it now appeared fixed to one spot. Others on the road were merely watching out for the first sight of the little town of Bethlehem. Although we watched for that too, we did not take our eyes off the star. The small town seemed to be perched upon a mountain precipice, with just one road leading up to the gates. Compared to the city of Jerusalem, the stonework in Bethlehem looked dull and weather-worn, a much poorer cousin to its more illustrious neighbour. I remember thinking that we might feel more at home here, not that we had a design on staying, and not because we looked shabby like the stone, but because there was the hope that perhaps here we would find the king. We had found a king in Jerusalem, but he was not the king we were searching for. We greeted the citizens at the gate. We smiled and did our utmost to appear friendly, hoping for, although not presuming on, a warm welcome. We mentioned that although we had just come from Jerusalem, we had in fact come on an extremely long journey, and within the town walls we hoped to find our journey's end. Those at the gates talked to us about a sorry lack of accommodation. However, although we were weary, our urgent ambition to fulfil this long-awaited task, to see with our own eyes the child born to be king and to worship at his feet, was too close at hand. With the end now in sight, we had been suddenly and joyfully revived. We also gathered some more vital information. Many, many months ago, a group of shepherds had clamoured at the gates of Bethlehem with a story of angels and prophecies and declarations of a newborn king right here in Bethlehem. The news had gripped the town. After a while, all the fuss had died down, but the young family and the baby boy, just a toddler, were still living down a back street in Bethlehem. Leaving our camels and most of our baggage with the servants, just inside the gates, where the animals could be watered without becoming an imposition, we, the learned ones, we the ones for whom and from whom this long journey had been instigated, set out together. We did not waste any time in brushing the dust from our cloaks and feet. We did not feel the need to preen ourselves, to make ourselves presentable before this king. It was not because we were expecting just a child, and therefore we lacked respect. It was because we sensed the overriding importance that being there was enough. Our desire was sufficient, and we would present ourselves just as we were before the one born King of the Jews. In uncertainty, we floundered through the darkening streets. We craned our necks to keep the star now a luminescent globe hanging low over the town, in our sights. Maybe nobody else could see the star, 
Perhaps we had been staring at it now for so long that it, it had simply burned into our imagination, deluding us in our quest. But maybe, and perhaps, were no longer things of great concern. We still had hope for a glimpse of a great and longed-for treasure. Along a narrow street, with many open doorways stretching along each side, where a few stray chickens and a few stray dogs pottered, picking through the stones, and the clatter of early evening domestic activities was just beginning, we followed the star. As if it had descended right into the alleyway, its beams of light shone upon the last open doorway. Clutching at each other's cloaks with intense excitement and sudden realisation, we saw a very young child. He was, like us, holding on to the clothing of another. For him it was habitual. Surely this was the child and his mother. She was sitting on a small wooden stool in the doorway of a very lowly dwelling. At first the mother and child did not notice us. Displaying the roundness of healthy flesh, the small child's hand and arm reached up towards the star. He was attempting to catch the silvery light. An impossible, but at the same time irresistible gain. His mother was laughing as any mother would at such display of endearing determination. At last, our faltering progression, slow step by slow step, betrayed our presence. And they both turned to look at us. A momentary, inquiring glance brushed the young woman's face, and with natural instinct, she clasped her hand around the child. Over her shoulder, she called out a name, Joseph. Out from the gloomy interior of the house stepped another figure, a man, we presumed the child's father. We stopped. There on the rough, gritty, dirty street, we stopped. We bowed down and paid homage to the child. Hushed astonishment crept over the faces of his parents. The little boy still clutched at his mother's tunic. He glanced back to stare at the star every so often, making sure his new playmate had not run away. We were nothing compared to the beautiful star. Very f few words passed between us. We stayed there only a short while. We opened our treasures and we presented gifts, gifts that had travelled with us from the east. We had brought a fortune, fit for no less than a king, gold, incense and myrrh. It had been such a long time since we had thought about the preparations we had made for the trip, and presenting these riches now to clearly a family of low status seemed incongruous. We did not know the God of Israel, we did not know how he worked, but we were convinced that this act of worship was the most important thing we would ever do with our lives. As we stood to leave, the rapid flurry of movement behind did not escape us. Figures disappeared into doorways or reverted to sudden activity, pretending that they had not noticed our strange enactment. Only when we finally gathered our desert train together to camp out under the stars did we begin to muse on the possible effects of our visit. What would that little family do with those luxurious gifts? Why had they hardly spoken a word? They hadn't even made the usual polite pretense at refusal. What was it about the little boy that dispersed all doubt about the validity and significance of this whole adventure? Laying our heads down with exhaustion, Though with burdens lifted and our hearts full, we were soon all gripped by sleep. And the God we didn't know, but whom we are now convinced set us on our mission, was about to reveal a little bit more of himself as we slept. The welcome of King Herod, the graciousness and warmth he had displayed towards us and our purpose, was in a blazing brushstoke erased, as we slept, a true portrait of deceitfulness was painted. With the dawn, a new weight was upon us, and over a piecemeal breakfast we shared our dreams. We realised very quickly that they were one and the same, and so, just as we had done at the very start, 
we brought out our charts and maps once again to search for a new route home.